Okay, so just behind us here, we've got Nap Hill and Golden Ball Hill beyond that. Um, what, what's Golden Ball Hill all about then? I mean, um, well, I think Golden Ball Hill, they reckon, is named after the flowers that grow on the hill. Right. Um, you'll be able to tell us four yellow, little yellow oh cup shaped flowers, but. Um, buttercups. No, they're not buttercups, <laughs> they're something else. Anyway, um, but I, that's one of the theories, anyway. But I think uh, what, what's interesting about Golden Ball is there was an uh, archaeological excavation there uh, back in the uh, 1980s, and they discovered uh, building platforms there, built into the side of the hill, compressed chalk, uh, post holes, and signs of um, fire pits, um, dated to around about 3,500 BC. So that's some of the very earliest uh, buildings that we know about in the area. Yeah. So fascinating bit of, of a glimpse there into what might have been happening yeah. when, when everybody was living up on the high ground rather than down in the yeah. valley. Yeah. I wonder where they got their, their water from up there. I think predominantly it would have had to be dew ponds. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't think there's any other way around it. And, and people talk about dew ponds being a sort of Victorian feature, but I think they're much, much more ancient than that. I can't see how else they would have managed. And they to traipse down into the village to uh, gather water and carry it back up would have been a massive effort. Yeah. And plus, you know, in those days it was it was pretty deeply forested and probably quite a scary place with lots of wild animals roaming around. You wouldn't want to do that mm. too often, I don't think. Even spirits. Yeah. Oh, yes. All of yeah. That. Yeah. And I guess just in front of that, I mean, we can see it from here is um, Nap Hill. Yep. Now, Nap Hill. I mean, we can see it actually here. There's a an earthwork just below the summit that goes around the perimeter, which is, well, I guess some people might mistake it for an Iron Age hill fort, but it's much older than that, isn't it? It is, yes. It's a causeway, it's a causeway uh, enclosure, basically. So it has a number of ditches, but lots of entrances. So it was a place for keeping your animals safe. Yeah. And it was possibly used as habitation, but not for long periods. There wouldn't have actually been a village there. Certainly not a fortified village. More of a stockade, probably, around the... Um, Inside the um, the ditch, there would have been fencing of some sort, wooden fencing. Yeah, and that that again dates to the Neolithic as well. So we're talking, you know, three and a half thousand BC again. Yeah. So if the the village was on Golden Ball Hill, that's probably where they kept their animals. Yeah. And again, you know, um, we're we're in a Neolithic landscape, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, just we just walked up over Adam's grave, which is again somewhere between four and a half thousand to three and a half thousand BC. So, would have been in use concurrently at the same time. Uh, sadly, rather badly excavated by a Victorian cleric, um, caved in from the top, we believe. But um, be wonderful to excavate that properly one day. Yeah, and it would be almost identical to these Kenneth kind of Longborough inside chambered tomb, uh, with with niches for. Uh, human remains which yep. are normally um 
allowed to rot um, outside before they were actually interred inside the yeah. the niches. They um, stack the bones up um, one on top of the other um, very neatly, but they think that's probably what happened. They allowed the bodies to uh, decompose and then put them in there. Yeah. Um, and of course, it's orientated to the east. So in the morning, the rising sun, as it is, Kenneth would come through the doorway mm. to mm. bring new life. Mm. So incredible, really. So in chronological order, you've got Golden Ball occupied first, then Nat Hill, and then... Well, this Africa, might be so even older than Golden Ball Hill, Hill. Yeah. yeah. So it's all, you know, you know, as far as you can date these things, it's all within a thousand years of each other. So we're talking anywhere from four and a half thousand BC to three and a half thousand BC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, a long, long time ago. Yeah. You know, five and a half thousand years ago or more. It's quite a thought. So, so we're actually stood here on the slopes of Adam's grave, and as we are here, I can really get a sense of the, the size and the scale of this thing. It's an enormous undertaking to have built this. Um, but actually, this area here has got some more recent history as well, hasn't it, Dave? It has, yes. Yeah. So um, Adam's grave was called by the Saxons uh, Woden's Beorg, um, because Woden was the father of the gods, and so he was the oldest person in their culture. Yeah. So they named him uh, Woden, Wodensburg, and named this Wodensburg. And um, in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, it's mentioned twice as being the site of some fairly major battles. Mm. And it's understood that possibly this was a, a ritual place to fight battles within this area. Um because it seems unusual to have two virtually on the same site, although they're separated by a couple of hundred years. Yeah. yeah. So um, the one I, that uh, springs to mind is 592, um, and that was, uh, again, um, Saxon, rival Saxon warlords basically punching each other up to yeah. succeed each other. Um, no trace of the battle's ever been found, so we, we've no idea whether it was this side, it says beneath uh, Wodensburg, whether it was to the north or to the south, um, we think it's more likely to be into the north because, again, with the Wandstike, which uh, we're going to visit later, possibly being a boundary, that may have had something yeah. to do with it as well. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And here, there's like a nice bowl almost carved out of the the hillside, which is probably why you get quite a lot of paragliders and people up here because mm. of the winds. It's a bottom. It's a Wiltshire bottom. Yes. Or a yes. coom. Or is a coom. Otherwise known as a coom. Yeah. yeah. Uh, stunning, isn't it? Absolutely stunning up here. It and is. in fact, you know, from the road uh, going past Tunnel St Bernard to Devizes, you can't really see how big this coom is. Yeah. Um, you just get a glimpse of it. But actually, seeing it up here on a day like today, it's absolutely stunning. And of course, with the, um, uh, the, the, the sun being as strong as it is today, it's picking out all the folds of the landscape, the earthworks and the, uh, the, the banks and the ditches. Um, so it's really accentuating those today. Um, so we're really quite privileged today, I think. So often it's covered in sort of white cloud, isn't it? A grey cloud. And yeah. It and, and looks blank. It's a photographer's dream, really. It is. Yeah. Fantastic for... Uh mid-September yeah considering August was dull and grey and cold I yeah summer's arrived finally yeah. <laughs> um, so here we're sat on some quite interesting sarsen stones um, obviously we have quite a lot of sarsen over in that direction over towards Westwood and Fifield Down but these kind of stand out as a sort of very small crop of sarsens and makes you wonder how they got here or whether they were originally here or offloaded from a cart or something yeah, I think they. I think they are original. I'm yeah. sure no one's going to move stones this size for fun, and no. uh, they serve no useful purpose here on the Dan. So I think they're just part of the original sarsen stone capping on top of the chalk, and uh, so many were moved and uh, used for building and uh, road making. But it's lovely to see them here, as they were. So we're actually standing on the, the Wands Dyke now, and quite an impressive structure it is, having just walked through the bottom of it. Um, I mean, the sides of it are incredibly steep, aren't they, David? Really steep, and um, if you walk it all the way from um, 
westwards towards um, Morgan's Hill and Devizes, you'll, you'll come across bits which are incredibly steep, um, amazing bits of uh, civil engineering really, and wherever possible utilising the contours of the hills to, to make it even more formidable. Um, one of the questions of course is how many people did it take to actually create this um, and ultimately the big question is when was it actually done which are questions that uh, are being debated at the moment and who built it and why yeah exactly exactly it's extraordinary. that but it's three three theories isn't there as to who built it and why and yep. whether it was defensive whether it was to keep um, or keep the, 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 the Danes out or to keep somebody else in and whether the Romans had a, a hand in it. Um, but for years, nobody's really been sure. No, they haven't. And of course, um, what's been fascinating is we've actually had a uh, archaeological excavation uh, here back in the tail end of June, beginning of July by University College London. And they were digging on a small section of unscheduled ancient monument to look at its construction and also to do analysis to find out um, if they could determine when the monument was started. Um, the theory that they're working on, which is, seems to be the one that gains most favour at the moment, is that it was built round about 800 um, mm -hmm. as, a, uh, as a dividing line between Wessex and Mercia. Yeah. Um, and it was, as you can see, built as a defensive uh, ditch and bank. And it uh, extends all the way to uh, Avermouth, um, and then all the way into Berkshire, but the, most of it from Wiltshire onwards is, is extinct in Somerset, has disappeared, and what little remains of it in, in Berkshire is, is very puny by comparison. This is probably the best yeah. stretch that we've just walked along. Yeah. Going back to the engineering, um, there really is uh, some sort of mystery over how many men it must have taken to construct it and how long it took to put up. Uh, when you think that, um, you know, the population of Wessex, by comparison with today, was quite tiny, this would have been a, a kingdom-wide effort. It wouldn't have just been villagers from the Pusey Vale uh, mucking in and helping out. They could never have done it. And also they got to take into account the, the seasonality of it. It, it. You couldn't work on this sort of earth monument in the middle of winter. Uh, because it would have got wet and the whole thing would have just collapsed on itself. And you probably would be confined to working around the harvest season as well because everyone was needed to bring the harvest in and to plant it. So all those questions hopefully are going to uh, be answered slowly. But if we can get the dating, yeah. um, then that will be the first step. And that will yeah. be fascinating. So within you know, the next three or four months, we're hoping to hear what the date might be and that will be definitive and it's the same method they've just used on the CERN Abbas Giant down in Dorset yeah. uh, which proved conclusively that there's a very similar date that was late Saxon so interesting stuff and the other the other thing I should mention about Wandstyke is they, they've been looking at parish boundaries and whether the Wandstyke respected parish boundaries so whether it was a pre-parish boundary construction and um, it doesn't so parish boundaries cross through Wandstyke, yeah. ah, yeah. um, which is fascinating. Yeah. And actually not far from where we're standing now were the Stanton St Bernard Gallows. And they were again on Wandstyke. Um, yeah. It was regarded as being outside the village and the place where yeah. things like that could be done. Because yes. uh, it was a lot of superstition about hanging people and their spirits coming back and haunting. Yeah. So, um, so you don't want it in your, your parish, do you? You don't, no. So, yeah, the old... Um, so the Saxon parishes that still exist today, I mean, all our, you know, village parishes, uh, boundaries are, are Saxon, but they're probably pre-Saxon. Mm. They could even be Roman. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they could have been boundaries for estates. No one really knows because nothing was written down. Yeah. So we just come down off the hills. Um, actually, we can still see them in the distance. Literally in my line of sight, I can see 
Adam's grave um, in the distance. But we come down to the villages now, and we're here in um, the village of Alton Priors, just outside um, the church here. So, I mean, what can you tell us about Alton Priors, David? Well, both, uh, both the villages, uh, Alton Barnes and Alton Priors, um, have the same first name, Alton, which is a uh, Saxon word, which uh, loosely translated means uh, settlement by a stream. So that's where the Alton comes from. And the Priors bit for Alton Priors uh, comes from the fact that it was after the Battle of Rawton in uh, 825, it was ceded to the Bishop of, sorry, the Cathedral Church of St. Peter and St. Paul Winchester, um, which was a Priory church. And so it was owned by the Priory. So it became Alton Priors, basically. Oh, okay. So that's the ownership. That's yep. what it's all about. Um, as opposed to Alton Barnes, which has got a, uh, another source, we believe, from uh, the Lord of the Manor, who held both Stanton St Bernard and Alton Barnes, and the, the name is De Berners. So in the case of Stanton, it's been sort of changed to St Bernard, and in the case of Barnes, it was called Alton Berners, has become Alton Barnes, so mm, right. that's the yeah. reason behind it. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a lovely, you know, uh, Norman church um, with a very early Saxon doorway. Uh, mm. which, has been, which has been sealed up facing north uh, with a very early Christian cross, um, almost like a Maltese cross with roundels carved into it. It's fascinating, isn't it? Because they often did that. I mean, the, the Norman churches were built on top of what were Saxon churches and Indeed, presumably yeah. the Saxon churches were built on top of what could have been pre-Christian yep. places. So Indeed. this could have been a, an original holy place for... I think without a doubt it was. And in a minute, we're going to go around the other side of the church and look at a very ancient tree. Yeah. But before we do so, I mean, of course, we've got here via the, the hollow. Which yes. Brought us from Adam's grave, which is we're looking at over there. Um, so that hollow, hollow way connects the hills up there with this place. It does. And I guess would have been used by people, you know, to, to over you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years to migrate from living up there to living down here by the source of, of, of water. Yeah, yeah. Rest. I mean, isn't Hollow following the path of the old Ridgeway? It is, yeah. 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 It's the extension from Avebury on right. across Salisbury Plain that eventually winds its way to Lyme Regis, I believe. Yeah, it's, exactly. um, I mean, it's it's very definite uh, here, and it peters out towards the Kennet Navan Canal. It virtually disappears, and then it's difficult to pick up again yeah, until yeah. up onto Salisbury Plain. But yeah. I, I like to think of it really as the the one stike and the ridgeway of being, you know, major cross country routes. It makes yeah. Sense. Um, yeah, yeah, and you know, it's almost like the M4 and the M25 now. Yeah. And people would have been going each and every way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And certainly, this would have been a, a stop off on the way. I mean, and the reason the Saxon village arrived here was clearly because of the springs, which is yeah. the uh, source of the River here, Avon. Yeah, um, they are the most northerly yeah. source of the River Avon. I quite like having that sort of connection. You know, they're not two distinct places, but mm. you know, there's, there's here and there's there, yeah. and they're connected by yeah. that, that, that that old route, yeah. that old trackway, uh, which and of course continues the other side of the church. It so does. We go around the other side. We're going to have a look. It, yeah, going across the meadows there. And a lot of people find it very strange to think that they're two little tiny villages each with a church of yeah. their own and you know they can't understand why we don't share one church but they were in separate ownership yeah, yeah. Um, for, for hundreds if not thousands of years yeah. so therefore each was a separate community separated yeah. by a tiny little stream yeah um, and that's that's the way it has always been and up until certainly the early part of the 20th century uh, the the vicar for this church uh, came from West Overton Mm. for Alton mm. Priors, and Alton Barnes had its own rector and a very fine house to go with it. Mm. But, you know, vagaries of history. Yeah. So, so what's this, David? This is um, one of the banks of the Ridgeway. Um, so we've walked down the hollow just now, and that comes through Alton Priors Village Street, uh, down through this area of nettles and uh, scrub, and then reappears in the field. And this is one of the most distinct parts of the, the bank, the earth bank and ditch. And it runs all the way down through here. Can't see it very well, and then ends up at the Kennet and Avon Canal. Right. Yep. So this is the Ridgeway that goes up towards um, Avery direction. That's right. Um, and then of course it becomes much more prominent up um, 
by the sanctuary up yep. towards Hackpen Hill and beyond. This is the extension really. Yeah. Um, and it, it comes round the edge of uh, the hills where we were just earlier um, beneath Adam's grave. It winds its way down. It sort of follows roughly the, the road line of the existing road and then it cuts down um, across round the back of Alton Priors and then emerges here. But the Alton Priors village street is actually the Ridgeway. Right. Um, but you can, you can certainly see the shape of something here, can't you? Very much so. And I think there were, there were old farm buildings built into the side of the bank here. You can see traces of sarsen stone here yep. and here. So um, they, they used the natural bank as, a, as a, almost like the back of the building. Yeah. And then probably had a, um, a cob, uh, cob walls and thatch. Yeah. And the roof probably was sort of somewhere up, up there, you know, coming back off there. So wow. some sort of cattle shed of some sort. Yeah. And this continues, I, I think I'm right in saying this continues as far, or it's visible as far as, we said the canal. The canal, uh, then it peters the out, no, and then it comes up on the plain. Oh, uh, okay. And then yeah, it yeah. works its way down to um, Lyme Regis, apparently, but yeah, I, I think it's yeah. very indistinct. But it's one of many routes, and yeah. uh, they've all been sort of clubbed together as the Ridgeway. The Ridgeway, But yeah. there were numerous Ridgeways. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, they may have all occurred at slightly different dates. Yeah. But they and of were course certainly there were branches off yes, of to, course, to yeah. take you to another community yeah, somewhere. Exactly. But they were the you know the prehistoric road network. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now this tree is old. It certainly is. It's uh, 1,700 years old, apparently. So it's one of those rare occasions where the church is here because of the tree, not the other way around. So yeah, the church probably predates Christianity in this part of the world. The I would tree imagine. does. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the tree was no doubt part of a you know a ritual sacred site dating back to prehistory, uh, and I, I think along with the, the springs um, and the tree, and there was very possibly some stones here. We've got one stone inside the church. We'll have a look at later. Uh, which may have been a standing stone. So it's, yeah, really interesting. You can see it's kind of built on an, an elevation as if there's some kind of a, an earthwork of some sort. Yeah, there, but... I, think, I think there's very definitely um, a slope down yeah. on the, uh, the um, south side there. Um, it's more pronounced on the south, um, but it's certainly a raised platform all the way around. But of course, it's been disturbed by graves being dug and, and the church being mm. built. But we'll certainly go inside and have a look at that stone in a minute. So these curious marks, I mean, they look like the gouge marks, really. I mean, they're, they're little pits, almost holes in the wall. So what are these then, Dave? Well, we think they're musket ball strikes, and they're certainly um, sort of military calibre shots. It's not the sort of thing that you would go wild filing with. Um, yeah. And uh, the inference that we've, uh, well, the conclusion I've reached, um, having read through the parish records, I'm going to read a bit to you from the parish records. Um, uh, this is July the 15th, 1643. Um, it says, Paid for the shoeing the horses of my Lord Wilmot and his troops who lay in both Alton's then. So the interesting fact about that is that was the day after the Battle of Roundway Down, uh, where Lord Wilmot led the Royalist cavalry, uh, rode them from Oxford. Um, there was a Royalist victory, as you, as you know, at yeah. Roundway. And he obviously then moved five or six miles down the Pusey Vale and decided to bring his regiment here to water the horses, to sort out the shoes before they returned to Oxford. So, you know, I've got no proof, but it's clear to me that, you know, the spread of, of musket balls, as you can see, going right the way right around, here, yeah. there's a bit of a gap in the middle where there's not very much going on. Um, but I wonder if they'd actually hung some sort of effigy off the sundial, which would have been there then, and we're using it as target practice, but uh, we'll probably never know. But um, I, I, you know, I think it's a pretty strong bet that that's the day it happened. You know, we can almost tie it down to the day um, in history. So we've just been inside the church now and um, had a good look around. But the thing that struck me is that there was a trap door. Mm -hmm. Underneath the trap door was a sarsen stone. That's right. Well, that was, that was discovered when the church was handed over from the Church of England to the Church's Conservation Trust back in the 1970s. They had to take the whole floor up. And underneath the floor, they discovered that sarsen, and they thought they'd keep it accessible 
to the public. So they built the hatch over the top. Yeah. So that's a fairly recent uh, invention. But again, you know, we have no proof. But it, it strikes me that this was a uh, a symbol of pre-Christian worship that was bought inside the church to help the local inhabitants accept that the church was the new form of worship. Yeah. And by putting the stone there, even though they've broken it, this it's been fractured and rotated through 180 degrees. So it's clearly been broken as a sign that the old religion has died. But, you know, as a gesture, we've shoved it under the floor. Yeah. Again, there's no proof for any of that, but sarsens with holes in them are regarded as quite special, as mm. you probably come across, because the stone is so hard that to yes. have a hole all the way through is really quite special. So I think, again, it, one, can, one can surmise that's all we can do. Um, there may well have been standing stones in this area uh, with the yew tree associated with a, a pre-Christian site of worship. Um, we'll, we'll never probably know. Um, it's probably almost impossible to do a geophys survey of the churchyard because of all the graves that have been dug. The amount of disturbance is such that I think it would be almost impossible. But, yeah, I think this has been a special place for millennia, definitely. So we're in between the churches of Alton Priors and Alton Barnes and the meadows around here. There's signs of um, Saxon settlement, isn't it, in, in these meadows? Certainly here you can see the earthworks, the earthworks of the village. Yeah. That's right. So, I mean, essentially, the original village was made out of uh, cob and thatch and has long since gone. So the later buildings from the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries have formed a sort of square, if you like, an outer ring around the original medieval village. Yeah. And the medieval village has turned into open meadows, which is rather nice. So all that remains, really, is the, is the later housing uh, around the edge. Um, and there's still lots of building platforms here. And this is a, an archaeologically sensitive site, so we're not allowed to uh, plough it or do anything to disturb the ground underneath. And I suppose by moving out, moving away from here, it's less boggy as well. Absolutely, yes. I mean, a lot of the houses, the older houses that have cellars, flood in the spring. Oh, they fill up with water, yeah. yeah. My house fills up with water. Yeah, yeah. But it's, I just have to accept it. It's just part of the, <laughs> part of the cycle, really. Yeah. yeah. So, onwards and upwards. Yeah. yeah, go to the church. Right. <laughs> Through the turnstile. <laughs> so this uh, rather impressive paved path that leads all the way to Alton Barnes. It does, and uh, we we know when this happened. Um, it happened in 1830 because the villagers of Alton Priors were getting absolutely fed up with not having any church services because uh, the rector for Alton Priors was the rector of West Overton had to ride across the downs on horseback and clearly on a wet soggy November morning he wasn't going to bother and I think that became a habit of not bothering and so when the new rector arrived by the name of Augustus Hare in 1830 the villagers of Alton Priors petitioned him to take services in their church which he readily agreed to, but he said, I'm not going to do that unless I have a path, because I'll get my cassock absolutely covered in mud. So this is the reason this path's here. And it's made out of sarsen stones, beautifully laid, um, and it goes all the way from the rectory in Alton Barnes to All Saints Alton Priors. But bearing in mind the two churches are about 300 metres apart. They are. <laughs> it was I know. a real hardship, wasn't it? It was a hardship. He didn't mind the distance, it was the mud. Yeah, yeah. And you can imagine, in the middle of winter, when this field has been really hoiked up by cattle, it was pretty unpleasant. Mm. So, um, so we've got a lovely path, thanks to the rector. So here we are outside um, another church. This one's in Alton Barnes, and this one is the, the oldest one here, isn't it? This is the original Saxon church. Yes, this is St Mary's Alton Barnes, and... Um, what you can see beneath the pebble dash on the lower layers is the original uh, Saxon stonework. And this is the blocked up north doorway, which was Saxon. So you can see these fairly substantial pieces of stone here and the stone footings at the bottom. Um, and these, um, these other details here are, um, this detail here is a pilaster, um, which is repeated all the way around. So yeah, this is a pre-Norman Conquest church. So you don't see so lucky. many of them around anymore, do you? No, there are very few and far between. Obviously, the Bradford on Avon's got a very yes. famous one, um, but to have one that's almost intact, obviously the roof has been replaced um, in the 15th century. The timbers were replaced. It's got Cotswold stone tiles. We've yeah. recently spent a lot of money on restoring it uh, inside and out, 
Um, but you know, it's 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 unique. Very very lucky to have it. And this this end obviously is is newer. Yeah, that's right. Um, but what about the base? Is that? Yeah, that's also same, same no no. Area, that's been it? reused. Yes. Yeah, different size stone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Water. Yeah. So that's a that's a Georgian chancel. Oh, Georgian. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but going to a bit more recent history, what, what's the story about the machine riots and how they impacted on this area, David? Right, well, the machine riots, the agricultural machine riots, um, happened in the late 1820s into 1830, the result of agricultural labourers being um, basically losing their jobs um, because of mechanisation. So the yeah. advent of the seed drill, amongst others, uh, the threshing machine, all of these things were making life easier for farmers, but harder for farm workers to find work. There was a lot of unrest in the countryside and groups of men went from farm to farm, breaking up these machines, setting fire to them, setting yep. fire to farmers' possessions. And um, it actually hit Alton Barnes in, in, uh, in 1830. And I'm, I'm fortunate to have a letter, which I'm going to read to you, uh, written by the, the rector to a friend. This was the 24th of November, 1830. And he says, for fear you should be alarmed by cross-country accounts in the newspapers, I write a few lines to say we are all safe, after one of the most painful days I ever went through. About two o'clock we were summoned by two half-drunken men. He professed to be sent on. They came to the door and asked for money, any trifle, announcing that two hundred were coming at their heels. After failing of their errand, they went down to Pyle's house opposite us, and that's just through the trees there, that's sure. Robert Pyle's house. Whither I followed them, he was gone to Marlborough, and there were none but women in the house. As the only chance, I had the church bell rung, which is just up there behind us. Um, but none of the labourers came. Perhaps they were too far off and did not hear. About ten minutes after the troop arrived, the thrashing machine had been taken to pieces, and that thrashing machine was located just in the farmyard, just opposite us now. Um, they must break it, and breaking it they were when Pyle on horseback dashed in amongst them and fired his pistol. They would have dispersed, perhaps, in a fright, but in a place where they could close with him, his gun went off a second time. They dragged from him, dragged him down and have nearly killed him. They then burst into his house and broke everything to pieces, and for some time I expected they would serve us in the same way. So irritated were they and so mad with drink. Indeed, they talked of coming back tonight and burning down all his ricks and barns. But the news had reached devices even before I could send a messenger. The yeomanry were here by six. So I've just heard they have surprised several of the rioters in the public house in Woodborough. So, great first-hand account of what it was like. It must have been terrifying. Must have and, been, yeah. And the house was completely mullered. Um, they went in there and smashed everything up. And um, I think the, there's another uh, uh, event, uh, um, story of this event, where that uh, Robert Pyle's manservant, actually, who was a big lad, went in and picked him up physically and took him to the house and barricaded the doors to stop them getting in. But, yeah. I mean, he could have been killed. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Quite easily. And, in fact, um, the yeomanry, the Royal Wiltshire Yeomanry, uh, they weren't royal at that stage. They were the Wiltshire Yeomanry Cavalry who were sent because there was no standing police force in the county in those days. They were the police, basically. They were called out. Um, they suppressed the machine riots in Wiltshire with such ferocity and so well, they were then get granted the title royal because they did such a good job um, and they put an end to it quite quickly. Wow. But, I mean, they were doing, rather like Peter Lou, they were doing full-scale cavalry charges on farm labourers. That's extraordinary. Yeah. I don't think many were killed, but no. um, it was certainly pretty fearsome. Uh, but some of them were transported, weren't they? They were. The yeah, they were. The rioters were mostly transported to Australia. Yeah. Um, I mean, they had a they had a genuine grievance, no doubt at all about it. But um, unfortunately, a lot of the people who were on these marches and doing the burning and the looting weren't actually farm labourers. They were just people who jumped on the bandwagon. Yeah. And we see that today, don't we, with protests? Well, in, in yeah. that letter as well, yeah. I mean, they were clearly full of drink. They were full of drink. And yeah. obviously up for a scrap. Yeah. A bit like you get, you know, the football hooligans. Exactly. It's exactly the same, it nothing exactly, ever changes. It doesn't change, you know, and I, I think the same with road protests and everything else. There's some genuine people in there with a message, but the people jump on the bandwagon, so... Um, yeah. So the Yeomanry, who would have funded that? Were they actually... They were funded the, by the government. Oh, so it was the army. <laughs> they were set up, well, they were reserve cavalry. Okay. They were set up um, in 1794 in Wiltshire to uh, augment the regular army in case of a French invasion by Napoleon, mm -hmm. because we were terrified that Napoleon was going to invade. Um, they were sort of equivalent in a way of the dad's army at the time, but a little grander than that. So all the great landed families in Wiltshire 
um, provided the officers. So there was the, the Aylesbury's um, from Tottenham House in Savannah Forest. There were the Tynes from Longleat. Um, uh, there were the Methuens from Corsham Court. Virtually every family you could name in Wiltshire was an officer in the Wiltshire Yeomanry. Right. And their tenants were the soldiers, basically. Ah, okay. But they were all good horsemen. Yeah. Um, but they weren't allowed to deploy outside the boundaries of the county of Wiltshire. They had to stay within the county yeah. um, until the, um, the Boer War in uh, 1900, when they desperately needed good countrymen who were good at horseback riding to deal with the Boers. And so they then formed the Imperial Yeomanry. Uh, which allowed whole regiments to join a different organisation, which were allowed to deploy abroad. So that was their first mm -hmm. proper engagement. And yeah. they did really well because they were all countrymen. They were good shots. Yeah. They were good riders. Yeah. Um, but yes, this was the time before, um, 1830, before a police force, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, and even the Peelers in London, I think, came soon after that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting times, but yeah. nearly... Yeah, to have an eyewitness account is just fantastic yeah, from the rector yeah. who lived here. And, and so good to actually hear that read out in this place where yeah. we can see the house. Where it happened. We can, hear, we can see the church bells, yeah. we can see the churchyard, it br yeah. brings it alive. Yeah. Mm.